Ladies and gentlemen, my name's Paul, and in this RedGamingTech.com video, we're going to be discussing, as well as analysing, tech news which, as usual, has popped up the past 24 or so hours. I hope you're all having an amazing day. My plague has not uh, got in any worse, which is fortunate, but it's not gotten much better, so I'm not going to be on camera again today. But we do have an awful lot of news to get through, uh, the first of which is a report from DigiTimes, and it's the first of a couple of uh, piece of AMD news. This one, however, concerns the amount of market share that AMD have in the server arena. So, as you are probably aware, Epic has been very popular with customers, and these do include companies such as Dell, IBM, and Nokia. Indeed, earlier this month, Dell has announced that they'll be building five new server designs with the second generation of Epic processors. And of course, now we have uh, Dell joining companies such as IBM, HPE, and many others as well. So a report over at DigiTimes has said that by the end of next year, which would be 2020, in case you're watching this in like several months' time, AMD will have around 10% of the total market share. Now you may say, well that's not massively impressive, but you've got to remember that Epic hasn't been on the market too long, and before Epic was released, the first generation, AMD quite literally had less than 1% of the server market. So they have quite literally increased their market share by 10 times, which is really impressive. Uh, with the second generation of uh, CPUs known as Rome, we have SKUs from 8 cores, 16 threads, all the way up to 64 cores, 128 threads. So AMD are putting an immense amount of pressure on Intel right now by offering a similar-ish amount of performance per core, but at lower pricing. Although I say similar-ish because, as usual, different processor architectures do uh, better or worse depending on the workload. I suspect that when Intel release the next generation server processors and then of course uh, AMD do the same thing, it's going to be a very interesting time for the marketing departments of both companies, let alone the actual reviewers and uh, companies who are uh, in charge of actually purchasing the hardware, because it's going to be very interesting to see how both companies manage to market the chips and also what actual performance differences there are between the next generation. And now on to some AMD Nave news. This actually concerns Nave 12 as well as 14. Obviously, Nave 10 launched back in July along with the Ryzen 3000 series CPUs, and we've seen numerous leaks for upcoming uh, lower end SKUs in the RDNA lineup. And we've seen uh, leaks and benchmarks with 1536 shaders. So. There is an update to this, and this comes to us via 3dcenter.org. I will, of course, link the article in the description of this very video. And a user on their forum, uh, hopefully I pronounced the name correctly, it's Berenen, um, I'm hoping I've pronounced that correctly, has actually been digging through the Linux drivers for, uh, for AMD and has found a couple of very interesting uh, entries. So 619 chip, uh, case chip, uh, underscore Nave 12, 620 Info, NUM SDP Interfaces 16, 622 Chip, underscore Nave 14, equal 8, I'm not going to read out the whole thing, and 3984 if AMD GPU is Nave 10, and then obviously some code there, 3994 P Info GFX 9 dot uh, equals 16. So this basically means that we are looking at a 256-bit memory interface for the Nave 10 GPU, and we know of course that that's true because, well, the RX 5700 and 5700 XT have been launched. Nave 14 appears to only have a 128-bit memory interface, whereas Nave 12 contains a 256-bit memory bus. So that's actually quite interesting for a number of reasons, the first of which is it brings us to a very obvious question. What is the performance tier of Nave 12? 
because if it was a 256-bit bus, and it looks like it is based upon this information anyway, it wouldn't really make sense for it to be a lower-end SKU uh, than the RX 5700. So it looks like it is a higher-performance tier GPU. We also have to take into account driver code as well. Narve 14 looks very similar, with the code anyway that we've seen, to Narve 10 in terms of raw architecture, whereas Narve 12 does look a little different. There are some slight differences. Now, that's not to say that Narve 12 is the next generation of RDNA with ray tracing and also makes you coffee in the morning, but there are definitely some slight differences. And in regards to the 256-bit bus, which is, once again, identical to Narve 10, assuming this information is accurate, that doesn't necessarily mean that the memory bandwidth is identical. After all, you could simply run with higher memory clocks frequencies on the GPU, which would increase memory bandwidth. Although I grant you, it would be interesting to see if this would mean that whatever variant this is going to be called, that's, say, RX 5800, would be memory bandwidth limited. We have seen some rumours that a RDNA-based GPU with 4096 shaders is on the way, although I'm uncertain if this would be it, given only a 256-bit uh, memory bus. Given it does appear to be a slightly tweaked version of the RDNA architecture, it's possible that it is slightly more memory bandwidth efficient with better color compression and so on and so on, but I don't think that's going to make up the gap to go from 2560 shaders all the way up to 4096, so my guess is that we have faster memory clock frequency, but the number of shaders is probably in the low 3000 range. So let's say we have 52 compute units rather than the 40 which is found in the RX 5700 XT. I suspect, although we'll of course need to wait for the actual product to release, I suspect though that that will put it past the Radeon 7 in terms of performance and probably nipping on the heels of the RTX 2080-2080 Super, which, if the price is good, that's just going to be excellent for us as gamers in terms of additional options. Next year, however, we are, of course, eagerly anticipating the next generation of RDNA cards, but I suspect that given that we're still seeing the first generation of Narve filling up, we probably won't see those next generation cards until the midpoint of next year. Next year, however, in graphics is going to be really weird, not just because we have the next generation of consoles, which will obviously directly impact what's going on in the PC space, but we also have Intel with their XE line of GPUs, and we also have NVIDIA. And I say it in such a tone with NVIDIA because, quite honestly, we know very little about what NVIDIA are planning. We've heard everything from we are, as in we gamers are just getting a Turing refresh, all the way to Ampere. But what even Ampere is and how it relates to Turing, whether it's a tweaked variant, whether it's an entirely different architecture, and so on and so on, remains pure speculation. Earlier this year, I did release a video that internally, AMD are referencing Narve 23 as a NVIDIA killer, which is unusual for the engineers of the company to be so confident with their discussions of the next generation products from the company. Obviously, marketing departments are expected to be rather confident with their communications to the outside world, but generally, from my understanding anyway, the engineers at Team Red are not typically so confident. By the end of the day, we'll just have to wait and see what the products are that all three companies release. One last story which somewhat concerns AMD, although mostly focuses on TSMC. The company are reported to be uh, beginning mass production of 5NM in 2020. This is yet another report from the Digi Times, and they will be aiming to hit mass production of 5NM in March 2020. So that's not too long at all, really. This will be built using extreme ultraviolet lithography, also known as EUV, if you want to be its friend and buddy, and is going to drastically improve both density and speed. 
how much? Well, if we compare it against the existing 7nm node, so 7nm, not 14nm, we're comparing this against 7nm, the performance speed is increased by around 15%, while density can improve by up to 80%, which is just absolutely ridiculous. We can also have a possible 30% reduction in power consumption, so that is quite significant. Now, it's important for us to realize that this is not going to impact the Ryzen 4000 series, because AMD themselves have essentially confirmed using their roadmaps, that, and they've already been taped out as well, that the second generation of RDNA, as well as Zen 3, are going to be using 7NM+. 7NM+, Plus is still pretty significant over 7NM. It does use uh, EUV for some of its fabrication process, and supposedly has around a 20% increase in transistor density. So it's still, you know, an improvement. It's just not quite the insanity that 5NM is going to bring. At a guess, I suspect that uh, 5NM is going to be for smaller dies, probably for things like uh, cell phones and that type of thing at the start. And then obviously uh, Zen 5 uh, is probably going, oh sorry, Zen 4 is probably going to be using the um, 5NM process in the future. Next up, a piece of news which basically concerns everyone. ARM, yup. AMD, yup. Intel, yep. Microsoft, yep. Um, because this concerns the Surface Pro 7 and Surface Laptop 3. There is a report that has emerged on the internet that is very interesting because it seems to indicate that the Surface Pro family as well as Surface Pro 7 are going to be having quite the radical shakeup. Microsoft are abandoning USB A ports, thank goodness, and the mini display port is also going to be disappearing as well. In place, we're going to be getting a Thunderbolt 3 as well as USB-C connection, which is pretty awesome. There's also a rumor that we will be seeing the latest and greatest Qualcomm Snapdragon process in there. Uh, if the rumor is accurate, it looks like the uh, most likely contender is the Snapdragon 8 CX SOC. Furthermore, there have been a few reports that AMD are going to be the sole providers of an x86 CPU solution, and that does not look to be the case. There are a couple of reports, including from TrustedReviews.com, who, according to their sources, have said that Intel will be a configuration option for the new Surface laptops. To put things in a nutshell, it's really going to depend upon your budget as well as the performance targets of the machine. There's said to be at least six different configurations of Surface Laptop 3, which is really odd to say. It feels like it should be Surface 3 Laptop or something like that, but that's just my opinion. Anyway, um, yeah, so there's at least six different configurations, and they're going to range in price drastically, so it's going to be from around 1400 bucks to around 2500 US dollars. So obviously you're probably going to see different CPU configurations based upon those scenarios with CPUs including the Ryzen 7 3750U looking to be an odds-on favourite for the AMD solutions. And in the final piece of news for today, China are starting production of domestic DRAM chips. So China have actually been seeking independence for... Uh, the production of DRAM for some time, and a company by the name of Changxing Memory Technology, it was founded in 2016, hopefully I've pronounced that correctly, uh, they have actually started this week, Monday, producing DRAM, and are looking to replace the supply of foreign memory from companies like, for example, Samsung. So it's actually built on 18nm technology, and Ch Chang Sing is calling it 10nm class. Uh, so the technology itself, in terms of the DRAM, isn't actually that far behind companies like Micron, Samsung, and the SK Hynix, which use between 12 and 16nm nodes for the production of their DRAM. The company have said that they're going to be producing 120,000 waf wafers excuse me, per month and plan to deliver the chips by the end of this year, 
but they are also saying that it's only for internal use in China. So in other words, for products which are created in China. So it's going to be interesting to see how all of that plays out, and uh, it may also affect the pricing of the DRAM that the we outside of China are also paying as well. Anyway, I think that's just about it for this particular video. Hopefully, you've enjoyed it. If you did, then the normal stuff. Like, share, comment and subscribe, because it helps us out a ton. And this weekend, we'll also see the uploading of the PlayStation 5 video that I've been working on, which is, will we see a PS5 Pro launch alongside the PS5, as well as some other stuff in there investigating the GPU generation. Uh, I decided to make it a little bit longer, so it's almost 40 minutes. The video and article are done, so they will be uploaded over the weekend. But for now, I shall see you soon. Take care of yourselves. Bye for now.